Are there any war protesters left to say no to the killing? Stay tuned. I'm Bob Otten, and this is Libertarian Viewpoint. Libertarianism is all about liberty, and liberty is the exercise of freedom that doesn't impinge upon the rights of others. Now, who couldn't like that? We constantly hear the drum roll of government solutions. The purpose of this show is to allow you to see for yourself why non-government solutions are a better alternative. Today, I have a video of the Minnesota Arms Spending Alternative Project and the Minnesota Libertarian party discussing the purpose of the U.S. military. The video highlights where they agree and disagree. You'll each be given six minutes. There will be no rebuttals during this time. It's regarding question. Uh, regarding Pentagon spending and federal spending priorities, we'll begin with Professor Jack Nelson Palmer. Give us an overview of Minnesota ASAP with regards to Pentagon spending and will you summarize the problem and solution as viewed by Minnesota ASAP. Just one thing about the, what I see the role or the purpose of government and the purpose of military spending, what it should be. It seems to me that the purpose of military spending should be to provide sufficient funds uh, to allow our nation to be prepared in order to keep the nation safe from outside attack. That, that would be the primary purpose of, of military spending. But the primary purpose of government, for me, is a little broader than that, and we'll get into some of these differences. The broader purpose of the government is to provide or help uh, in the basic security of the U.S. population. And for me, that involves health care, it involves education, uh, it involves a number of other, other things. So, what I would like to suggest, and what, what led uh, me and others to serve Minnesota ASAP, is a belief that U.S. military spending levels and policies are now completely disconnected from that basic purpose of, of national defense, of defending the borders of the country. Dwight Eisenhower, many of you are familiar with as president of the United States, his last speech of the country, he warned the country about what? The military-industrial complex. And when he gave his warning, he was warning us that U.S. democracy was in trouble because of the unwarranted influence of the military-industrial complex, and he was warning us that military spending levels and even the wars the nation would fight were now disconnected from actual defense needs. And they were driven by other motivations, power and profit. The other point I, I want to make in my initial comment is just to point out that defense is not the same thing as power projection. And I was really impressed with a study by the Cato Institute, which generally reflects libertarian views a couple of years ago, that was very clear about this. It has said, U.S. Uh, national security policy is not about defense. Uh, joining with more progressive voices, like uh, Andrew Bacevich, for example, who has just said, military spending in the United States is driven, and U.S. foreign policy is driven by power projection worldwide. That is very different than defense. And if we actually had a defense uh, budget, uh, we would be able to dramatically reduce military spending and, in fact, enhance the security of the country. Now, let me just illustrate that point with, with, with one quote. It's a quote my students are probably familiar with. It comes from Ron Susskind, who, on the eve of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, was told by a high-level Pentagon official after Susskind said, this is going to be a disaster if you invade Iraq for the Rockies, for the U.S. And the response back was, Ron, the problem with you is you and others are in the reality-based community. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. Well, that's power projection and arrogance that has nothing to do with the authentic security of the country. In my preliminary comments and in this opening statement, I'd also like to point out how costly military spending is to Minnesota. You may remember that we shut down the state uh, budget, or our politicians shut down the state budget over a $5 billion, two-year shortfall. 
Over that same two-year period, Minnesota taxpayers spent $8.4 billion just for our share of the Iraqi Afghan war. All told, as you can see by a banner that we have outside, Minnesota taxpayers, Minnesota taxpayers have now spent $41 billion just for our share of Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, one other figure, a couple I'd like you to keep in mind. You may have seen, oh, many of you probably didn't, a front page article in the Star Trib not long ago. And it was a sky is falling article written basically saying, if the military budget is cut as a part of sequestration, Minnesota is going to lose 4,000 jobs and the state will lose $3 billion in revenues over the next nine years. Wow. What it didn't say is how much deeper the pain would be if, military, uh, if the cuts are in the non-military sector. And what it didn't say, although it said Minnesota uh, government is going to lose $3 billion over nine years, it didn't say that Minnesota taxpayers over the next nine years will spend more than $140 billion just for our share of the base military budget, a military budget that has effectively doubled over the last 12 years. So what I want us to do and what we want to do in Minnesota ASAP is we're encouraging conversations at all levels of the state. And we're encouraging those conversations by going into communities, to city councils, to county commissioners, to library boards, to school boards, to churches, to synagogues. And we're having a conversation about what we would like our communities to look like. And what are the current problems that people are facing that aren't being addressed. And we want to help people make this connection between federal spending priorities that prioritize war and militarization and local and state needs that aren't being met. And that's another way of saying that we really are trying to unleash our imaginations and have a conversation around what, would it, what kind of state do we want to live in. And this is where we're going to see some differences between uh, the perspective of Minnesota ASAP on, on what we should do with these dollars and the libertarian view. But very important, and one of the reasons for tonight is I believe really strongly that we need to be building alliances, including with people that we disagree with on some issues. And this is an, this is an issue that many, many, many people are beginning to agree on that we are in trouble because of our military spending, our military priorities, our militarized foreign policy, and that we have tremendous opportunities. Thank you. Please give us an overview of the Minnesota Libertarian Party with regards to Pentagon spending. Will you summarize the problem and solution as you play your part? To kick off my introduction, I'd like to start with a bit of history to put this issue into perspective. Uh, this issue of our military spending in this country is very important, and that's why the Libertarian Party of Minnesota wanted to get behind uh, Minnesota ASAP on this issue, despite some of the differences. Is there anyone here who remembers the movie War Games? It's just an iconic movie from the 1980s, uh, 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 where we faced the threat of nuclear destruction. Uh, Fortunately, in the movie, it was a game that very nearly became real as the plot of the movie went. So that threat, along with, with all the various wars that happened around the world as the two superpowers jockeyed for, for uh, influence, was the setting in which the U.S. experienced four decades of heavy and growing military spending. Now, let's fast forward to today. Today, the U.S. faces no serious foreign adversary. There's no one who poses a serious threat or is capable of conducting an invasion. Today, those who are a threat to us live in caves. Uh, they know how to make improvised explosive devices. Once in a while, they can hijack a jetliner. They can probably do a few more things than that. Uh, but they are not anywhere near the threat that was presented by, by uh, the threat faced by Americans with the Soviet Union uh, of total nuclear annihilation. Now, believe it or not, though, military spending levels have roughly doubled since the height of the Cold War. Does that make sense? Here's something else. 
Uh, this chart is linked via our resolution on our website. I don't know if everybody here can, uh, uh, can, can see this, but I'll, I'll talk you through it for those in the back. This is a chart of global military expenditures. Um, it's from a couple years ago, but it really hasn't changed since. The biggest slice of the, the pie that you see, 46.5%, um, that's U.S. military spending. Almost half of world military expenditures are by the U.S. Okay, number two, uh, at 6.6% is China. So they're, they're hot on our tails. <laughs> Uh, third is France, with a little over 4%. Uh, fourth is Britain, with 3.8%. Uh, Number five is Russia, with 3.5%. Now this next slice right here, this orange slice, are the next 10 countries of the world combined. Uh, they comprise a little over 20% of world military spending. Now these are countries like Australia, Canada, India, Japan, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Spain, and Italy. Okay, these are no pushover countries, but combined, they're just 20% of world military spending. Uh, the next slice is about 15%, and that's the rest of the world. So a little over 100 plus countries make up 15% of, of world military spending. Does that make sense? Looking at this from a, a game theory standpoint, all a country should need for a military is one size the same as the next potential adversary, plus an additional margin, say, maybe 10 or 15%. So if you're a leader of another country, and you're thinking about attacking your neighbor, uh, but then you see the size of their military, and you think, hmm, we might get our butts kicked. So I better not do that. That's what a military is for, for defense and to serve as a deterrent. The problem is, with a military that's as large as ours, it's no longer offensive, or it's no longer defensive. It's built for offense. It becomes a hammer, and soon all the problems around the world start to look like nails. It becomes all too easy for our politicians in Washington to send the military out to do whatever they think needs to be done. Okay, uh, antagonizing the natives of those places, creating enemies where there were none, and that pretty much justifies our government's foreign policy today. Uh, there are more reasons why having such a large military is actually harmful, and I hope to get to those a little bit later. But that's just an, inter an overview of where things stand today, and I'm very glad that Minnesota ASAP is finally focusing some public attention on this issue. Thank you. The bright line at which one sacrifices individual liberty or utility in the name of assisting those in need and preserving life, liberty, and the pursuit of liberty in others. Do you understand the question? Well, I would pose the question somewhat differently and say that I think um, the line for me is, is that my well-being is tied up in the well-being of others. And my well-being uh, is negatively impacted in a society as unequal as ours. For example, how many Americans know uh, that if you divide U.S. wealth into quintiles, that the bottom 40% of Americans, guess what percentage, my students should know this, guess what percentage of wealth that bottom 40% has? Less than three-tenths of 1%. That impacts my quality of life. That impacts the quality of life of the society in my, my, my When we underfund education, it impacts the quality of my life. So I, I see my well-being and my future intimately tied into this thing called common good. And I, I think uh, that's not a sacrifice. It's just a, a basic ethical uh, and, and, and moral standing uh, that, that says that. And, and says that we should be together, uh, yes, responsible as much as we can for our individual behaviors and our individual lives, but we're all part of social systems. <coughs> And it seems to me, certainly Catholic social teaching would say, we really are our brothers and sisters' uh, uh, keepers, right? We're, we're in it together. So I, I would just rephrase the way that it was said and said, I don't think there is a bright line. I think the overall principle is that my well-being is intimately tied to the well-being of others. 
Uh, the line, and this is something that uh, is really the core of our position as libertarians, uh, the line where uh, one's individual liberty ends is the point where the next person begins. So we as libertarians believe that uh, people should be able to live their own lives however they choose, or to earn or spend their own money however they choose, as long as they don't infringe upon their neighbor's equal right to do the same. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, interaction should be voluntary. So if, if you want to help your neighbors, that should be something that you do voluntarily. Uh, helping the, helping the, a charity of your choice. Okay, if you have, if you have time, okay, volunteer at a neighborhood charity. Uh, if you don't have time, uh, uh, write out a check. Um, contribute in whatever way that you are able. Um, but people should not be forced to helping their neighbors, okay, through the tax system where people pay taxes and then politicians make those decisions. We prefer to see the individuals make those decisions because individuals are going to care more about how their own money is being spent uh, versus if that those decisions are made by government where it's going to tend to be, uh, that money will tend to be allocated in order to favor the politicians' political interests. So, basically, uh, one person's liberty stops where the next person's begins. Thank you. Jack had one quick comment. Well, as far as I know, one of the only people who called for the elimination of government or said it would fade away was Karl Marx. I don't think libertarians are Marxists from what I can, what I can gather. So, I say that uh, tongue-in-cheek, but I say it because I want to make a point, and that is, I think, uh, my assumption is that the government is going to be with us. And the question then becomes, as citizens, what kind of government and what kind of government policies do we pursue? And the case I would make is that over the last 30 years in particular, we have seen an overwhelming preponderance of policies dictated by people who have a lot of money and by corporations that have a lot of money. That means that decisions are made every day. It's not just an individual making it. The individual didn't make a decision that in Minnesota uh, we would have a $6.15 minimum wage. Uh, an individual didn't make the decision uh, that, that we would in Washington, D.C. have politicians that, that said, we're really going to get in the way of labor unions forming. We're going to have tax policies that ensure that the wealth go to the richest 1%. All those are public decisions made by government. So the idea, we're not going to get rid of government. Hopefully, if we organize, maybe we can have maybe smaller government in some, in some way. Certainly, I believe the military should be smaller. But there's going to be some places where we actually need bigger government. And, and again, one case I'll make is health care. Now, there are different models, and I'd be glad to talk about the different models. But what they all have in common, and they do better than us, is they're not for-profit systems. And that's a decision that governments have made in Japan, in South Korea, in Europe, and elsewhere. And for half the cost, they get better health outcomes than we do. And it covers everybody. So that, that's the point I would make. Is we're not going to get rid of government. It's not the individual on, on the individual's own. So we better be shaping government policies that help individuals, but also help the common good. Professor here just uh, made the statement that uh, one issue that he sees as a problem is that uh, decisions are being made and influenced by corporations and by the wealthy based on the amount of money that they have, right, essentially. Uh, I would say that the problem, though, is not money. The problem is, is the power of government. Government, as it becomes more powerful, has more power to be able to dispense taxpayer assets to those who it wishes to, uh, uh, to rob that money to. So uh, as that happens, um, yes, it's, that's, that situation is going to tend to benefit the wealthy. Uh, but the problem is not money. The root of the problem is that government has power and increasingly has more money at its disposal. Um, on the uh, issue of smaller government, I can definitely refute that. Uh, how much time do I have? One minute. Okay. Uh, a great example, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the professor here is looking to countries like Japan and Europe in terms of the healthcare system. I think that's definitely the wrong place to look. Uh, the, the right place to look are co countries that, that actually have a, a free market in healthcare. Now we're getting a little bit off the topic of 
uh, arm spending and so forth, but I'll, I'll continue to pursue this. Uh, if, you to, if you go to a country like uh, you know Western Europe or Japan or even now the United States, people, the government is trying to solve the problems of rising healthcare costs by distributing that by force, by taxation, upon a greater share of the population. Uh, the, pro the problem is based on uh, 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 the fact that government has interfered in the healthcare industry in previous decades. That's leading to rising costs, which government is trying to solve by even more legislation. Using military as a defensive deterrent was mentioned by you, Jack, earlier. Could more be said about this? What are the pros and cons of this power-based deterrent? Do you see any other ways to create and sustain peace? I mean, I think that, and you said this well earlier, um, I think one of the big problems you have when you have an inflated military sector and you have these enormous self-interested reasons for promoting militarism in war, you end up with, with very counterproductive approaches to, to, to peace. And in fact, uh, I would say at least to the, to the opposite. And so I would say if we want to live in a more peaceful world, uh, then we would be paying attention to issues of, of hunger and poverty, inequality, sustainable agriculture. We would be paying attention to, to all kinds of, of uh, essential needs. And we would put more resources into those things both at home and abroad and uh, place far less emphasis on militarization. I'll give you, uh, again, one example. I was really kind of stunned uh, to read uh, a variety of reports as I was writing my most recent book uh, from the Pentagon. And interestingly, even when George W. Bush was denying climate change as a reality, the Pentagon was doing study after study indicating that climate change was, was real, it was happening, and it was a security issue. The problem I had with those reports is that they laid out then a vision that said, therefore we have to militarize more because climate change is going to make the world more unstable. Rather than saying, why are we spending uh, about 85 times more to militarize than we are to address climate change? So that's an example of, yes, I think that there are peaceful alternatives. I think that there are international partnerships. I think that there are lessening our dependency on oil. I think there are many, many things that we could be doing that would make the world a much more peaceful place. And militarization gets in the way of those. If our goal is a more peaceful world, I agree. The military definitely is not the answer. Um, things like protectionism also tend to come up on this issue. And I think it's worth kind of uh, touching on this briefly. Uh, there are people out there who, you know, people in Washington who believe that our next major war could be China because China is a, is a distant second in, in terms of military power. Uh, I've got a response to that. Not going to happen. Uh, can you imagine the uproar in, in Washington from uh, companies like Walmart or others who get their goods from China who uh, would not be able to get them anymore because a war would break out? And similarly, uh, now, uh, there would be an uproar over there as well by their manufacturers who would not be able to export anymore to here. Uh, of course, China is not a uh, democratic system, but their leaders are still keen to what's going on because they don't want to face revolution. So, uh, uh, but trade works both ways. And uh, I visited China a few years ago. And I can tell you that the most popular cars on the road there were by far Volkswagens and Buicks. Uh, for some reason, the Chinese people love Buicks and they love American cars. Uh, they, they enjoy the, the sense of quality. Um, so the way to promote peace is not through military force, but by breaking down these international borders and barriers through peaceful commerce and free trade, because nobody wants to shoot their customer. Um, I would like to invite the two uh, to, to come up here for their final two-minute statements. To summarize, uh, I know we did talk a little bit about uh, things like climate change and some other things earlier. Now, what has all this got to do with, with military spending? I would say that's exactly my point. Uh, by piggyback this, piggybacking this unrelated issue on, uh, you're distracting from the core issue and, and losing support. 
I think that Minnesota ASAP needs very broad support from this effort to have any chance of success. A piece of every B-2 bomber or every F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is, is built in every state. Uh, so that's, that's to make sure that howls of protest go up if anybody tries to cancel the program. The military-industrial complex is entrenched. So this needs to be something that more than the DFL supports. And if it is, if it is just DFL, then uh, uh, it's going to get lost in the typical headbutting that, that happens between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I think Minnesota ASAP needs to focus on this issue like the way that Minnesotans United did on the marriage issue. Stay focused on the marriage issue without any other distractions. Uh, they were able to pull broad support from the public, including libertarians, independents, and some Republican groups, not just the DFL. I think this military spending issue could draw wider support. <clears throat> I don't know if there are any relics of Ross Perot's old organization or similar organizations, <clears throat> but based on fiscal concerns, I think they'd get behind your organization on this. I, I want to highlight two things. Uh, one is, I think one of the strengths of Minnesota ASAP, and I would invite you all to be part of it and think about different uh, groups in your community, different churches you might be a part of, uh, libraries that might be in your, in your local town, city councils, and I would encourage you to take this resolution. But I think the, the strength of Minnesota ASAP is really the first question that we are asking people in their communities is for them to do an assessment of what's going on in their community and what would strengthen their community. This is a very democratic question. It doesn't have one answer. It's really rooted in what do people in Red Wing think about what's going on in their community? What, what, what needs to happen? What would improve life there? And then Minnesota ASAP can come along and say, well, you know what? Here's some realities about military spending and how much taxpayers in Red Wing have paid or how, many, how much taxpayer money have, have gone into these, in my view, illegal, immoral, counterproductive wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. And not only that, but how the fear-based uh, system and politics in this country over the last decade has allowed the military budget to just escalate the base Pentagon budget. So I think those community conversations are the most important thing about Minnesota ASAP. Well, we're out of time. If you find yourself agreeing with the speakers, you might be a libertarian. To find out, take the world's smallest quiz at www.theadvocates.org. Remember, Libertarian Viewpoint brings you the non-government liberty-based solutions that other media refuse to tell you about. Liberty works and is always the best choice. If anyone in government can prove otherwise, I challenge them to speak up. To view past shows, search YouTube using Libertarian Viewpoint. Thank you and stay tuned for other shows of Libertarian Viewpoint.